The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Step 1 D is for definition. 3 Dodging bullets, fear setting, and escaping paralysis. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. 20 feet and closing. Run, run! Hans didn't speak Portuguese, but the meaning was clear enough haul ass. His sneakers gripped firmly on the jagged rock, and he drove his chest forward toward 3,000 feet of nothing. He held his breath on the final step, and the panic drove him to near unconsciousness. His vision blurred at the edges, closing to a single pinpoint of light, and then he floated. The all-consuming celestial blue of the horizon hit his visual field an instant after he realized that the thermal updraft had caught him in the wings of the paraglider. Fear was behind him on the mountaintop, and thousands of feet above the resplendent green rainforest and pristine white beaches of Copacabana, Hans Keeling had seen the light. That was Sunday. On Monday, Hans returned to his law office in Century City, Los Angeles's posh corporate haven, and promptly handed in his three-week notice. For nearly five years, he had faced his alarm clock with the same dread. I have to do this for another 40 to 45 years? He had once slept under his desk at the office after punishing half-done project, only to wake up and continue on it the next morning. The same morning, he had made himself a promise. Two more times and I'm out of here. Strike number three came the day before he left for his Brazilian vacation. We all make these promises to ourselves, and Hans had done it before as well, but things were now somehow different. He was different. He had realized something while arsing in slow circles toward the earth. Risks weren't that scary once you took them. His colleagues told him what he expected to hear. He was throwing it all away. He was an attorney on his way to the top. What the hell did he want? Hans didn't know exactly what he wanted, but he had tasted it. On the other hand, he did know what bored him to tears, and he was done with it. No more passing days as the living dead. No more dinners where his colleagues compared cars, riding on the sugar high of a new BMW purchase until someone bought a more expensive Mercedes. It was over. Immediately a strange shift began. Hans felt for the first time in a long time at peace with himself and what he was doing. He had always been terrified of plane turbulence, as if he might die with the best inside him, but now he could fly through a violent storm sleeping like a baby. Strange indeed. More than a year later, he was still getting unsolicited job offers from law firms, but by then he had started Nexus Surf, a premier surf adventure company based in the tropical paradise of Florianopolis, Brazil. He had met his dream girl, a carioca with caramel-colored skin named Tatiana, and spent most of his time relaxing under palm trees or treating clients to the best times of their lives. Is this what he had been so afraid of? These days, he often sees his former self in the underjoyed and overworked professionals he takes out on the waves. Waiting for the swell, the true emotions come out. God, I wish I could do what you do. His reply is always the same. You can. The setting sun reflects off the surface of the water, providing a zen-like setting for a message he knows is true. It's not giving up to put your current path on the indefinite pause. He could pick up his law career exactly where he left it off if he wanted to. But that is the furthest thing from his mind. As they paddle back to shore after an awesome session, his clients get a hold of themselves and regain their composure. They set foot on shore, and reality sinks its fangs in. I would, but I can't really throw it all away. He has to laugh. The power of pessimism, defining the nightmare. To do or not to do, to try or not to try. Most people will vote no, whether they consider themselves brave or not. Uncertainty and the prospect of failure can be very scary noises in the shadows. Most people will choose unhappiness over uncertainty. For years, I set goals, made resolutions to change direction, and nothing came of either. I was just as insecure and scared as the rest of the world. 
the simple solution came to me accidentally four years ago. At that time, I had more money than I knew what to do with. I was making 70k dollars or so per month, and I was completely miserable, worse than ever. I had no time and was working myself to death. I had started my own company only to realize it would be nearly impossible to sell. Oops, I felt trapped and stupid at the same time. I should be able to figure this out, I thought. Why am I such an idiot? Why can't I make this work? Buckle up and stop being such a insert expletive. What's wrong with me? The truth was nothing was wrong with me. I hadn't reached my limit. I had reached the limit of my business model at the time. It wasn't the driver, it was the vehicle. Critical mistakes in its infancy would never let me sell it. I could hire magic elves and connect my brain to a supercomputer. It didn't matter. My little baby had some serious birth defects. The question then became, how do I free myself from this Frankenstein while making it self-sustaining? How do I pry myself from the tentacles of workaholism and the fear that it will fall to pieces without my 15-hour days? How do I escape this self-made prison? A trip, I decided. A sabbatical year around the world. So I took the trip, right? Well, I'll get to that. First, I felt prudent to dance around with my shame, embarrassment and anger for six months, all the while playing an endless loop of reasons why my cop-out fantasy trip could never work. One of my more productive periods, for sure. Then one day, in my bliss of envisioning how bad my future suffering would be, I hit upon a gem of an idea. It was surely a highlight of my don't happy, be worry face. Why don't I decide exactly what my nightmare would be, the worst thing that could possibly happen as a result of my trip? Well, my business could fail while I'm overseas, for sure. Probably would. A legal warning letter would accidentally not get forwarded and I would get sued. My business would be shut down and inventory would spoil on the shelves while I'm picking my toes in solitary misery on some cold shore in Ireland. Crying in the rain, I imagine. My bank account would crater by 80% and certainly my car and motorcycle in storage would be stolen. I suppose someone would probably spit on my head from a high-rise balcony while I'm feeding food scraps to a stray dog, which would then spook and bite me squarely on the face. God, life is a cruel, hard bitch. Then a funny thing happened. In my undying quest to make myself miserable, I accidentally began to backpedal. As soon as I cut through the vague, unease and ambiguous anxiety by defining my nightmare, the worst case scenario, I wasn't as worried about taking a trip. Suddenly, I started thinking of simple steps I could take to salvage my remaining resources and get back on track if all hell struck at once. I could always take a temporary bartending job to pay the rent if I had to. I could sell some furniture and cut back on eating out. I could steal lunch money from the kindergartners who pass by my apartment every morning. The options were many. I realized it wouldn't be that hard to get back to where I was, let alone survive. None of these things would be fatal, not even close. Mere panty pinches on the journey of life. I realized that on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being nothing and 10 being permanently life-changing, my so-called worst-case scenario might have a temporary impact of 3 or 4. I believe this is true of most people and most would be, holy shit, my life is over. Disasters. Keep in mind that this is the one in a million disaster nightmare. On the other hand, if I realized my best scenario or even a probable case scenario, it would easily have a permanent 9 or 10 positive life-changing effect. In other words, I was risking an unlikely and temporary 3 or 4 for a probable and permanent 9 or 10 and I could easily recover my baseline workaholic prison with a bit of extra work if I wanted to. This all equated to a significant realization. There was practically no risk, only huge life-changing upside potential, and I could resume my previous course without any more effort than I was already putting forth. That is when I made the decision to take the trip and bought a one-way ticket to Europe. I started planning my adventures and eliminating my physical and psychological baggage. None of my disasters came to pass, and my life has been a near fairy tale since. The business did better than ever, 
and I practically forgot about it as it financed my travels around the world in style for 15 months. Uncovering fear disguised as optimism. Fear comes in many forms, and we usually don't call it by its four-letter name. Fear itself is quite fear-inducing. Most intelligent people in the world dress it up as something else. Optimistic denial. Most who avoid quitting their jobs entertain the thought that their course will improve with time or increases in income. This seems valid and is a tempting hallucination. When a job is boring or uninspiring instead of pure hell. Pure hell forces action, but anything less can be endured with enough clever rationalization. Do you really think it will improve? Or is it wishful thinking and an excuse for an action? If you were confident in improvement, would you really be questioning things so? Generally not. This is fear of the unknown disguised as optimism. Are you better off than you were one year ago, one month ago, or one week ago? If not, things will not improve by themselves. If you are kidding yourself, it is time to stop and plan for a jump. Barring any James Dean ending, your life is going to be long. Nine to five for your working lifetime of 40 to 50 years is a long ass time if the rescue doesn't come. About 500 months of solid work. How many do you have to go? It's probably time to cut your losses. Q&A questions and actions. If you are nervous about making the jump or simply putting it off out of fear of the unknown, here is your antidote. Write down your answers and keep in mind that thinking a lot will not prove as fruitful or as prolific as simply brain vomiting on the page. Write and do not edit, aim for volume. Spend a few minutes on each answer. 1. Define your nightmare, the absolute worst that could happen if you did what you were considering. What doubt, fears, and what ifs pop up as you consider the big changes you can or need to make? Envision them in painstaking detail. Would it be the end of your life? What would be the permanent impact, if any, on a scale of 1 to 10? Are these things really permanent? How likely do you think it is that they would actually happen? 2. What steps could you take to repair the damage or get things back on the upswing, even if temporarily? Chances are, it's easier than you imagine. How could you get things back under control? 3. What are the outcomes or benefits, both temporary and permanent, of more probable scenarios? Now that you've defined the nightmare, what are the more probable or definite positive outcomes, whether internal, confidence, self-esteem, etc., or external? What would the impact of these more likely outcomes be on a scale of 1 to 10? How likely is it that you could produce at least a moderately good outcome? Have less intelligent people done this before and pulled it off? 4. If you were fired from your job today, what would you do to get things under financial control? Imagine this scenario and run through questions 1 to 3 above. If you quit your job to test other options, how could you later get back on the same career track if you absolutely had to? What are you putting off out of fear? Usually what we most fear doing is what we most need to do. That phone call, that conversation, whatever the action might be, it is fear of unknown outcomes that prevent us from doing what we need to do. Define the worst case, accept it and do it. I'll repeat something you might consider tattooing on your forehead. What we fear doing most is usually what we most need to do. As I have heard said, a person's success in life can usually be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. Resolve to do one thing every day that you fear. I got into this habit by attempting to contact celebrities and famous business people for advice. 6. What is it costing you, financially, emotionally, and physically, to postpone action? Don't only evaluate the potential downside of action. It is equally important to measure the atrocious cost of inaction. If you don't pursue those things that excite you, where will you be in one year, five years, and ten years? 
How will you feel having allowed circumstance to impose itself upon you and having allowed 10 more years of your finite life to pass doing what you know will not fulfill you? If you telescope out 10 years and now with 100% certainty that it is a path of disappointment and regret, and if we define risk as the likelihood of an irreversible negative outcome, inaction is the greatest risk of all. 7. What are you waiting for? If you cannot answer this without resorting to the previously rejected concept of good timing, the answer is simple. You're afraid, just like the rest of the world. Measure the cost of inaction, realize the unlikelihood and repairability of most missteps, and develop the most important habit of those who excel and enjoy doing so. Action. End of chapter 1, part 3.